Hello and uh, welcome. Uh, so, uh, as the presenter said, I will talk about the Elm, or I will learn to love front-end development. So, just a quick word about who I am. Yeah, I'm Marco Perone. You can find me on Twitter as Marco Chateau, or you can have my email, m.perone at mvlabs.it. Uh, I work at a company called mvlabs in the northeast of Italy, where in my daily life I'm usually a PHP developer. And, but I also find the time sometimes to experiment with some new things, and I'm among them, uh, lately in the last year, I found out about, about Elm, and I tried it, and I really loved it. Uh, so, what is Elm? So, Elm is just a programming language that it's made to run in the browser. This means it's created to make web apps. Uh, it's a purely functional language, uh, and it has uh, static typing. Uh, so now I would like to go through these three bullet points to look m much more closely what they do mean in the Elm context. So first thing, Elm runs in the browser. So as I just said, uh, it is, was made to create web application. Uh, in practice, this means is that you write Elm code, and then what you will get is some HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So we'll just uh, write all your code in just one programming language, that is Elm, and then you will compile it using such a command in your console, and what you will get as output is some HTML or some JavaScript uh, with the CSS, if needed. As I said, Elm is a compiled language. There is a compiled process. So I would like to meet you. Uh, I would like you to meet your new friend, the compiler. Is generally very kind, so he says, "Nice to meet you." Uh, why I'm saying that the compiler is friendly is your friend. Well, because uh, when you're doing Elm development, the compiler is there not only to catch bugs, but is there to really help you trying to solve them. So. Uh, Sometimes when I'm programming something in Elm, I really feel I'm doing something like compiler driven development because there is the, the feedback cycle between the developer and the compiler is so short that it really looks like you're having some kind of conversation between uh, with the compiler. And the, the jargon that the compiler sp speaks uh, is actually uh, really friendly error messages so what you're going to do, you will just write some code and just try to compile it. Uh, the compiler might say, uh, yeah, OK, your code is fine. Or it will say, OK, no, you screwed up. You did some mistake, and I will tell you why. Uh, so for example, just one of the easiest possible errors that programmers will do, uh, we'll just have this code, two lines. We have a variable uh, which contains a string. And we are passing that variable to a function called text. Actually, we are doing a oh, where is the pointer? We are doing a typo there, and so the compiler will tell us, well, you got a naming error. We I'm not able to find the variable message that you're using there. Maybe you wanted to use the variable message. Uh, it will tell you exactly which line and which word you are screwing up. OK, and the other really nice things that the compiler will give you is that in Elm, uh, you will have no runtime exceptions. So what does this mean? It means that you will be able to eventually forget about things like undefined is not a function, which I guess uh, every people programming JavaScript is quite accustomed to. So in practice, this means that uh, the end user experience, the experience of the user using your application, will never be compromised by uh, bugs present in your code. So the code is much more reliable, because once it compiles, you can trust it to, to run. Uh, this is a little bit different than when it compiles, it is correct. Uh, if you want to know that your code is actually correct, it's doing what you would like to do, you probably should add some unit testing or some other kind of testing. Uh, OK, but how can the compiler achieve friendly error messages and mm, achieve to eliminate runtime exception for your front-end applications? Well, it uses the other two bullet points I was mentioning in the beginning. 
So let's start from the first and let's talk a bit about functional programming. There's kind of a hype lately uh, around functional programming. Uh, I, I would like to share it with you my personal point of view. It may be not the most correct, not the most true point of view, but it's just mine. Uh, and I will start just uh, from a, a definition of function, because functional programming deals with function. So usually when we are doing computer science or programming, uh, by the word function, we mean just uh, usually uh, a group of lines of code that are just performing something. So if we want to be more precise, maybe we should talk uh, about subroutines when we mention uh, this concept. So if we want to see an example, uh, usually a function in almost every programming language looks like this. So you have maybe a keyword, then you have the name of the function, a list of arguments passed to the functions. Uh, and then you have the body of the function where you just perform some operation. And then from that um, thing that you perform, you will take some result and return it to the caller of the function. Okay, so now if we want to try to draw a picture to represent what we have here in code, uh, a function could look like something like this. Well, we have just a box in the middle, that is our function, that is taking some arguments as inputs and it's returning some results as outputs. This is great, looks simple, that's really similar to what they taught us in school, what a function was in school, uh, but it's actually not a really faithful representation of what the concept of the function concept I defined to you uh, just some minutes ago. Uh, why? Well, because uh, often a function to do its job uh, really needs to use the context where it is defined. So, for example, just think uh, to global variables, a function accessing global variables, or just a function using the this keyword that is uh, omnipresent in object-oriented languages. And so, uh, in the drawing, I say, uh, except for the input given by the arguments, the function needs to use also some context uh, that it will get from the state of our application. And by symmetry, uh, if we want our function to be useful, uh, to actually do something to the state of our application, to make the, the state of the application progress, we want it to actually alter the, con mm, the, the, the state of our application, the context uh, where the function is. So for example, if you want an example of this, you could think of a function making HTTP calls or writing to the file system or writing to the database. So now if we take a step back uh, and look at this picture, uh, we see that we have our black box in the middle, well it's green, not black, but anyway. Uh, and we see that it's kind of have two sets of inputs, the arguments and the above context, and it has two sets of outputs, the output results and the new context produced by the function. Wouldn't it, it just be easier if we had one set of inputs and one set of outputs? Well, actually, yes, it would be simpler. And this it's the main idea that is behind functional programming. So functional programming tells you, well, uh, if you want to have something in the function, you must uh, pass it to it uh, as uh, an input parameter. And if you want, uh, well, and the only thing that your function can actually do is just return something as an output value. This results in a much uh, more clear way of writing function because everything is much more explicit. Inputs are explicit as parameters, outputs are explicit as output values. Uh, the drawback of this uh, is that we cannot anymore interact directly with the state of our application. Uh, what we can do is just we can return as output uh, the changes that we will like to happen. So we can describe the changes that need to happen and return them to the caller of the function. So uh, some kind of inversion of control happens uh, with 
mm, in non-functional functions, uh, is, it is the function who will interact with the state of the application. Uh, now the function is just returning something to the color of the function and it's up to the color of the function to decide what to do with the output of the function. Uh, another good thing that we have from this approach is that since the function cannot interact with the state of our application in any way, we are assured that for any input, the output will always be the same. So if we have the same input twice, the output result of the function will stay the same. And from a technical point of view, this really helps because functions become really more easily testable, uh, become, become more easily cacheable, and become more easily parallelizable. So from a theoretical change of how we see functions, we get some really nice technical uh, properties of our functions. So just to be a little more practical about this, let's try to look at an example. So this is a piece of JavaScript code. We have a function set special index that is taken as input an object and a value, then is setting a special index parameter, passing in the value that we receive, and then it is just returning that object. Well, if you look closely here, we are doing two things that are not allowed in functional programming. So first thing, we use uh, the special index that is never passed to the function. It's just defined in a more global uh, context. And actually, in JavaScript, when you set the parameter of an object, you're actually modifying the object. So you're altering the state of your application, uh, not just returning something to the, to, the, to the caller, but actually this line will modify the state of your application. So uh, how would we do something like this in a pure functional language like Elm? Well, for example, this is the same code in Elm. What we will do, we'll need to add another parameter to our cell special index function, passing to it the index that we want to actually uh, modify. And the other thing that changes is in this line, and it's more tricky, uh, because what will happen is not clear from the syntax. Uh, that object here passed as a parameter will actually never be modified. Uh, that will always stay the same. What we are going to return, we're going to return a new object that is similar to the previous one, except that the index key now has this value. So we're just taking a copy of the previous one and modifying that one. Uh, so uh, a nice side effect of functional programming is that everything needs to be immutable. Uh, what do I mean by this? I mean that once you assign a, var a value to a variable, you can never change it again. So once a variable has a value, that will stay there forever. So this is kind of maybe bad from one point of view. We cannot more have setters in our applications. Uh, but uh, the plus is we don't need to worry anymore about other parts of the application changing the variables we are actually working with. So for example, in Elm, if you try to declare uh, twice a variable, maybe in two really far apart parts of your applications, uh, you just define twice uh, your variable message. Well, the compiler will tell you, hey, mm, uh, your naming is kind of ambiguous. I cannot decide what is, what is the, the actual value of that variable. You should maybe do some renaming to clear up things. OK, uh, let's go on now with some, something about static typing. So what does this mean? Well, static typing, it means that the type of every expression in our application where by type, I mean, is this thing an integer? Is this thing a string? Is this thing a list? Is this thing a function that takes an integer and returns an integer? Well, the type of every expression is determined at compile time before the application actually runs. Uh, so this means that every type-related error will be notified to you during compile time. So actually, when you, developer, have the application in your hand. This differs, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this differs uh, from uh, dynamically typed languages, 
where mm, the type errors are actually uh, caught at runtime. So possibly when your user, your final user, has the application in his hands. So from a mm, practical point of view, this means that a large class of errors, all errors related to typing, are caught early during the development. And they are also caught closer to the time and the location where we developers introduce them. So it will be easier to understand when, where, uh, where they are. So let's try to see an example of this in Elm. So I'm just defining up there well, the point. Uh, a function at 3 that is taking a parameter int. And it is returning uh, that int plus 3 just a really stupid function. And what happens if I am calling the function add 3 passing to it a string that contains the number 4? Well, since Elm is also strictly type, uh, this means if you want to uh, change a string to an integer, you will have to do the casting yourself. The language is not going to do it for you. Well, the compiler is going to tell you, well, I was expecting an integer, but you gave me a string. Ah, uh, that's not correct. And you will get immediately that information. And also another uh, important thing of strict typing is that it removes the needs of doing some trivial testing of your, on your function. For example, uh, it, in Elm, it really doesn't make sense to test uh, what happens to the add free function if I pass a string to it, because the compiler will never allow that to happen or what will happen to that function if I'm passing undefined to it, because undefined is actually not a number. Uh, since types are so important in Elm, uh, and the compiler is so helpful, well, actually, the compiler is going to find out the type of every expression in our application by doing type inference. Uh, so if we have our add free function, well, actually, the compiler is going to infer that it has type number. It is a function that goes, takes a number and returns a number, where number can be an integer a or a float. So anything that can be received a plus uh, function. If you want, uh, you can declare the type yourself, writing them in your application. For example, we could write this line, this declaration at three uh, column number, uh, arrow number. Or we can restrict the declaration of our function and say that this function just takes an integer and returns an integer. Types are usually uh, really nice when written in your code because they work uh, first thing as documentation. So we know what that function does. Uh, and they have also the, the good perk that they can guide the development. Because consider if you have a variable of type A and a variable of type B, Maybe there are not so many functions that can take us from type A to type B. So you maybe have just only one option to do that operation. So just knowing the types, we know what we need to do. And the last great thing about uh, the compiler and uh, static typing is that the compiler is able to enforce semantic versioning on the version number of the packages. So uh, what is semantic versioning? probably you know, but I just wanted to recall it. So uh, the version of a package is just identified by three numbers, one for the major release, one for the minor release, and one for the patch number. And since the compiler in Elm is able to, to know the types of all your function and all your variables, it will be able to determine if when you want to release a new version of your package, uh, if you are, you are releasing a breaking change. So if you're having a breaking change in your package, well, the compiler will force you to release a, major a new major version of your application. So this means, talking practically, then you will be able to update the dependencies of your applications without worrying uh, breaking something on your, the dependency of your application. So, uh, in Elm, the package manager is just reliable. You can trust it. And yeah. So now I would like to skip well, the, the rest of the theory, let's say in Elm, 
and just present you a little simple application uh, I wrote. And it's just this one, nothing fancy. Uh, well, it's the game of the Hanoi Towers. I would like to recall to you how it works. Well, uh, it's a game you should have three, well, you have three disks uh, and you have three pegs, three possible positions where you, your disk can go. And you can just move disk around one by one, paying attention never to put a bigger disk above a smaller one. And the aim of the game is just move all your disk from the starting pack to another pack. So, for example, if we want to, oh, where is the arrow? So, it's here. All right. So, if we want to move up this from the first bag to the third bag, well, we just move it there, and then we move from the uh, first bag to the second one, and then I could stay here playing all day long, but maybe we don't have time for that. Uh, so, uh, we'll just go on. And I will tell you also about this little application is architectured. Well, I'm using the Elm architecture, that's just, I will say, a pattern that emerged naturally while writing Elm application. And its uh, main concern is just uh, separate the concerns of your application, uh, where these concerns are uh, the state of your application, how do we render that state to the screen and how we are able to uh, interact with, the, with that state, how we are able to change that. So uh, let's start from the most important thing, that is the model, how do we model our application. Uh, so uh, I will try to draw and evolve through the rest of the talk a little diagram to illustrate this architecture. So the model is the most important fun, uh, thing, so we'll just we'll need to be in the middle of our application. So it's just a little box in the middle of our application. Uh, since the model, uh, well, the model is the most important part of our application, uh, not because it's the, the hardest to write uh, while coding, it's pretty easy to write it, but if you screw it up, if you just model your application in the not best way, you will probably get into some trouble when, while writing the other parts of your, your application. So uh, I recommend to always spend more time, more than one thing on your model. So let's go back to our application, our game of the Hanoi Towers. Uh, how could we model it? So uh, our first take could be this one. So, well, we have some disks, and we just say, well, disks are integers. So, for example, the smallest disk is the number one, the second smallest disk is the number two, and so on. And then we have three packs, and each pack can have multiple disks. So we just represent this with a triplet. We have three packs, and each pack has a list of disks. Okay, mm, uh, could work. Uh, we are able to represent every possible position that we will be able to obtain in our game with this model. But what if at a certain point we will, who knows how, end up with this model? So this would mean we will have, well, on the first pack we will have the first disk, the third disk, and the fifth disk. On the second pack, the first disk and the second disk, and no disk on the third pack. So this is actually possible with this model, but it, this is not possible in reality because the fourth disk is not there and this needs to be consecutive. And actually we have the first disk in two different packs and that is not physically possible. So maybe we should just try another way to represent our model. And a better way could be this one. So uh, let's start to change our point of view. So do not think first of disk, but think first as of packs, as position. So we have defined first the type position, and we say this could be the first pack, the second pack, or the third pack. And then we just say, okay, our model is just a list of position, where the first element of the list is the position of the first disk, 
the second element in this list is the position of the second disk and so on. So now if you think a little bit about this, uh, about this model, uh, this can actually represent every possible state of our application but also every possible representation, every possible state of this model is a valid state of our game. And this is really nice, it will make our life easier writing the other parts of the application. And I would like also to mention that will uh, make really easy to do stuff like uh, property-based testing because, uh, well, you will just try random states of your model and will uh, assert things on those states. Uh, well, uh, now we model our game, but if we want our user to interact with it, we need to keep track also of something else. So for example, uh, well, we need to keep track. We have here the status, our Hanoi model is just the status over the game. And then we need to keep track also of the pegs uh, that the user wants to move uh, the disk from and the disk to, and also maybe a message that we want to show to our user. Okay, now we model our game. Next thing we would like to do is just render it to the screen. To do that, we have the view part of the Elm architecture, and that consists just of a function called view. Uh, yeah, not so. Uh, well, that will just take our model and return some HTML. So the view function, according to the state of the model, will produce a description of how your HTML should look like. Uh, then what will happen under the hood uh, is that that description of uh, the HTML will be passed to the virtual DOM. The virtual DOM will compare that with your actual DOM, will get the minimal set of differences that needs to be applied to the actual DOM and it will apply them. And this is also a really performant approach. So let's try to have a look uh, how our view function could look like. So I don't want you to read every line of code, it's just too many lines uh, to read here. Uh, what I would like you to notice is just here we have many divs, one OL, one LI, some classes, one ID. So it really looks like HTML, but it actually is not real HTML because we don't have angle brackets. Uh, actually, all the things we have here, divs, class, OL, LI, ID, they are all normal Elm functions. And so what we are going to do, you're going to describe how your view will look like. Well, you have a div that contains a div, that contains a div, that contains an OLL, that contains a list of LIs. Uh, so it's really a descriptive uh, approach. And also, here, we have got no mutation of the DOM. It's just completely descriptive. And uh, the fact that we are using just uh, simple end functions uh, leaves really a lot of space for optimization. Since they are just functions, we can uh, cache their result, uh, we can lazy load, the, load them, uh, we can do really a lot of tricks to, to implement uh, uh, the performances. Okay, now that we were able to render our model to the screen, we would like to make our user interact with it. And to do that, we need to pass to the update section of the M architecture. So how does that fit in our diagram? Well, like this. So uh, we had the model and the middle, it gets rendered to some HTML through the view function. Uh, well, actually, our HTML is able to produce some messages. These messages will be routed all the way around and will be fed to the update function. This update function will take also the current state of the model and will just compute the new state of the model. Then this new state of the model will be re-rendered by the view function and the cycle will continue. So uh, what kind of messages do we need to have here so that the user can interact with us? Well, in our particular application, the messages could be these ones. So we could have, well, a message to track the fact that the user chose the peg where it wants its move to start from. Well, message for the, the, 
the user that chose the ending pack uh, one message to say, okay, there was some error, we need to show it to the user. And the last one is just we need actually to move a disk from this pack to this pack. Now, how can we trigger these messages from uh, our HTML, from our view part? So, yeah, too much code, but let's focus here. So here we have a button that has a non-click attribute. So this means that in our real HTML, we will have a button mm, node, and when the user will click on it, uh, this on-click attribute will just send the message returned by this try move function that you find here. It will send that message to the update function. And what will the update function do with that? Well, it will just take the message, the current state of the model, and return the new state of the model. How? Well, let's take, for example, the error message. It's the easiest one here. Well, you take the error message that contains a string, that's the actual string we want to show to our user. And you're just saying, well, the new model is the, like the previous one, except that the message uh, parameter contains the message that we receive via the message. OK, so let's try to recap uh, this a bit. So we have, again, the model in the middle gets rendered to HTML by the view function. When the user interacts with this HTML, messages will be produced and will be routed to update function. Then the update function will just produce a new version of the model, and the cycle will go on and on in this unidirectional data flow. OK, at this point, everything seems cute, I must say. Uh, but there is one thing that is missing. So actually, we are, our application is able to interact only with the user standing in front of our monitor. It's not able to interact anyhow with remote services. It's not able to do uh, HTTP calls to remote APIs. It's not able to talk to a WebSocket server or similar things. Uh, so to do things like that, we need to introduce a new concept, that's the concept of effects. So effects, as I just said, are just interacting with uh, the outside world. So for example, making HTTP calls, uh, listening to WebSocket messages, or even generating random numbers, because that is not actually possible in fun purely functional programming. And so, uh, usually we are mm, used uh, to do these things, ATP calls or similar stuff, uh, just by performing side effects inside our functions. Since in pure functional programming we cannot do that, uh, what we do instead is just represent these effects as data. So we would like to perform an ATP call, well, let's just describe what you would like to do as some data and pass it it to somebody else who's actually able to do that job for you. Uh, in the case of Elm, that's uh, the runtime. So I would like to show you how this works just, uh, well, with the same game as before. Now we have two copies. Uh, they are actually unaware one of the other. They're just talking through a WebSocket server I have on my machine. Uh, so, oh, well, where I am here, if I do a move, on this, well, it propagates on the other, and the same thing if I do a move here, it propagates to the other, not just because they are on the same page in my slides, but because they are talking to a WebSocket server that notifies also the other copy. Uh, so, mm, how does this work? Well, mm, we have two sides talking to the external world, uh, first thing we would like to do is just ask the outside world to do something for us. And this is done through so-called commands. So I will just describe, I would like to do this. Uh, I don't know, you are just uh, go buy some milk. I will write it on a stick note and put it on my fridge. And then I wait that, mm, yeah, my, a friend of mine is gone there, is gone into the shop and buy the milk. Uh, well, uh, yeah. So how does commands fit into uh, our diagram of the Elm architecture? Well, they are up there, 
and what changes with respect as before is that the update function is not able only to create the new version of the model but what it does it will just uh, create also some commands and this commands well mm, the update function will say okay uh, do this HTTP call and we'll pass that to the Elm runtime so you see it's outside the boundaries of our application uh, then the Elm runtime will take that command and uh, it will just mm, do, the, do it and when that thing is completed we will receive a message back and that message will be fed into the update function as we had before and then the cycle goes on and so uh, since now things are asynchronous because we are passing things outside the boundaries of our application and then we will be notified later uh, we will need to improve our messages to keep track of that so we'll need to uh, add a request move uh, message to tell uh, okay I would like to do this move ask that pass it as a command uh, to the Elm runtime and then when that thing is completed receive a message move back back uh, to actually perform the move and how this message uh, gets treated by the update function well what we do is just uh, we take the message we create uh, just some JSON where we store the information uh, we need to store and just we send it to our WebSocket server that's it and okay we were able to send commands to our WebSocket server but yet we're not able to receive information for our WebSocket server uh, to receive information from the external world uh, we need the, the last part of the Elm architecture that is subscription subscription is just something that will enable us to listen to things uh, anything that could happen uh, in the external world so subscription is just down here uh, how do we create them? Well, we have a subscription function that according to the current state of the model will just tell us you need to listen to these things or to that thing and then when that thing happens in the real world well, uh, just a message will be created and will be routed to the update function uh, so, as I said, subscription is just a function that uh, according to the current state of the model will tell us what do we need to listen to and okay in our case we need every time we just need to listen to our WebSocket server and when we receive uh, a message uh, our WebSocket server will just send a string to us we want actually a message so we'll need to decode that string and from the string create a message and then that message uh, will be fed into the update function and then we can create a new command we can create a new model and then the cycles uh, will continue so okay uh, I think I ran a bit I'm done so thank you